Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Luke Hunt and this is another podcast for The Diplomat and with me is Uwe Rack, the director of the Future Forum Think Tank in Phnom Penh. And they've done marvellous work over the last few years. Uh, an organisation like this simply, they didn't really exist 20 years ago. Uh, but Barack, um, Cambodia is, the dynamics have shifted in recent years with China coming to the fore and in particular the Mekong River. How do you see that shaping up from a Southeast Asian Cambodian perspective, say over the next five to 10 years? Well, uh, South China Sea uh, remains the, the biggest issues for Cambodia and ASEAN as, as a whole. Um, just because we are we're either victims of, of, of geography or we are a member, full member of ASEAN and, um, and many of the ASEAN member states are claimants to, to the to South China Sea as well as their four party parties to the, um, to the tensions and conflicts there. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the main issues over the next five to ten years will remain uh, South China Sea uh, geopolitical rivalries, I think the rise of China will continue to dominate uh, the, the conversation. Uh, I think the Greater Mekong, the Mekong River, but also the, the Greater Mekong, the geopolitical aspect of, of the Mekong itself uh, will be a second topic uh, that's going to be right. uh, quite uh, dominant in the next five, ten years. I think in, in, in perspective, you look at South China Sea, I think it has to do with the the, the trading lane. Um, it has to do with the other strategic interests of countries mm-hmm. like Singapore, um, Malaysia. Of course, I think the the Taiwan Strait issues, uh, but also mainly because it's actually interesting. I mean, it's really an important and the strategic interest of, of America, right. the remaining superpower. I mean, they still remain the the the, the, the main superpower. Of, of the of the world in the next five five ten years, uh, but I think if we, given China's rise, the real backyard to China is down south, which right. is the the Greater Mekong countries. We have mm, Myanmar, mm-hmm. uh, Thailand is going to be um, you know it's going to be important uh, countries for during that rise of China. Uh, it's going to be a, a more strategic uh, country. Uh, Vietnam is going to be, I think, it's going to be, unfortunately or fortunately, it's going to be the center of, of, of future tensions the, with the rise of China. And, and I think Cambodia could be clustered among that just because of the proximity and, and history. Right. Cambodia and Laos are all part of the, the old Vietnam War, but also part of the old Indo-Chinese uh, bloc or, uh, under the French uh, colony. Sure. Uh, we've seen, um, we've had a drought for two years. Mm-hmm. Uh, the dam construction is absolutely extraordinary in Laos. It makes no sense. I mean, for a country whose GDP is about 18 billion, the five dams alone, uh, mm-hmm. north of the capital, like near the Thai border, costs like 12, 13 billion. And of course, there's all these other mega, mm-hmm. uh, mega infrastructure projects going on as well. Have they pushed the whole dam issue too far? Is this like, at what point is enough enough? There's, there's a few reasons for the dams uh, along the Mekong. One is because we have landlocked and poor, very, very poor country like Laos, mm-hmm. who could not uh, look at other alternatives than, than becoming a, the, the battery, the so-called battery of, of, of South Asia. Right. So, so I think if you look at the, the economic strategy, they, they looked at, uh, at that as the only way out, mm-hmm. unfortunately. Uh, second, you have we have a rise in China who basically uh, have these dams building capacities, including companies and machines mm. and, and the know-how. Uh, they have to find exports once they no longer need these machines and these capacities uh, within their own country. Mm-hmm. So they need to try to go around and actually build dams elsewhere and hopefully offloading the, the capacity but also getting other countries to start to pay for, for their uh, for, for their companies, uh, and many of them are state-owned companies, so basically getting uh, that money back now or in future payments. Uh, for those countries that's unable, the choice would be very limited. Uh, of course, this has happened to Laos already. Though, this, this is happening to Laos. They've lost Cambodia. control of their electricity grid. Correct, and, and so you have that happening in, in Laos with the, with the dams 
happened in the, uh, Sri Lanka with the with the ports, uh, for example. So 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 we're seeing that as as the second the second reasons why many of these the old capacity and over capacity that China no longer need that they they find try to find uh, new markets for the, for their own companies and their own financial and economic interests. Uh, but I think there's a third component to that, and that is the influence within the within the region, within as I said, I think South Asia, particularly the mainland South Asia, the Mekong Five, right. are there, are, are China's bad guys. It's yep. going to be strategically important for China, and they they need to control that. And I think the dams, as well as many of the other infrastructure projects, will always going to be fall in line with that third uh, strategic importance for for China. Right. Uh, the so-called China debt traps, <laughs> which have been cited uh, sh- from Sri Lanka to Fiji mm. in this part of the world. Uh, and we've seen what happened in Laos where it was forced to cede control of its electricity grid. And ca- uh, the Chinese have been massive investors in Cambodia over the last you know, five to eight years, I guess. I mean, it's been, it never went away, mm-hmm. but, <coughs> pardon me. Uh, do you see any issues for Cambodia when it comes to China and debt? Uh, going forward, there's there's some truth to the the issues of debt trap diplomacy uh, from China, but that's not the whole picture. I don't think. Right. If you look at the if you look at what China is trying to do, of course, I think they're trying to have influence. Mm-hmm. But many of the countries are actually willing to bite. Just if you look at if you look at the list now, the list right, you have uh, Sri Lanka is one of them, but Pakistan, right. Pakistan is actually getting into it, knowing full well why they want to, do, to get into that, that partnership, that marriage with, with China, right? Uh, strategically, uh, Pakistan is an important strategic country for, for China, uh, provide a strategic interest for China, but also China is providing important economic and, and hope might possibly be strategic interest for, for Pakistan. As that's the same thing for other countries you mentioned. Mm-hmm. Laos is a one-party state. Yeah. They have absolutely no interest in actually opening up the kind of the, the, their countries to Western influence, uh, or f- falling into a different kind of trap, right? Whether it's actually coming from that or that or or conditions that they might not like, the the ruling party might, might not like, because mm-hmm. they then will have to fulfill Western conditions. Right. With Laos, it always seems to be a choice between Vietnam, China, Vietnam, <laughs> China, and, and, and Laos is very interesting because they they are one party state. They 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 depend on on China uh, on Vietnam's backing for the for a very long time. Mm-hmm. And and now you just have a bigger, far more, uh, a far deeper pocket uh, backer right. uh, that's coming to play. And, and so it gives Laos that option, but the option would, the other options would go to the West. The West is not coming with, with billions of dollars for infrastructures. It's, they never have. Mm-hmm. So so I think I think you have to look at it from, from not just debt trap, but also from uh, perspective of a one party government, one party state like Laos, who who have no interest in opening up the, the countries to liberal democracies. Right. And and so 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 they, they get into that marriage of convenience. I I'm not sure um, I think for the for the ruling elites the calculus must have been that the uh, that the benefit is actually much more direct to them. Mm-hmm. Uh, while the cost is actually share throughout the whole country with poor country, uh, poor voices, well, we've act- we've poor seen people who have very little uh, right. voices anyway. Uh, I'm not convinced that the money will be spread around. Uh, exactly, and if you look at the, no. the, the interest and the benefit is going to the ruling elites and, and while the the cost is going to be shared by the people. Right, and uh, Thailand recently uh, said in regards to the new dams across the mainstream that they uh, that Laos should yeah. not assume that they would be buying any more electricity off them, which would kind of undercut the whole intention of the program. Mm-hmm. But uh, again, going back to the drought, and mm-hmm. there's also um, been some scientific speculation that the course of the Mekong is changing because of the drought mm-hmm. and because of the dams. And that is having a play on sovereign borders, mm-hmm. which Thailand is, uh, uh, for all the issues concerning that government and the military there, that this is something that uh, they are quite concerned about. <laughs> Look at Thailand. I mean, th- th- I think the Thailand ruling regime or the the the, pra- you know, the, the military, the, you know, the, the, the military kind of junta government, mm-hmm. they they're desperate for legitimacy. Uh, 
Yep. And and because of that desperation related to him, we've seen the protests now by young people on the streets in, in Thailand, a constant protest and a mm. constant uh, pushback against the, the ruling uh, military regime. Uh, that desperation will mean that Thailand will, will be a lot more sensitive to anything that could be seen nationalistic right. or that, that could be seen in, as a national issue. So they'll, they'll take a more nationalist uh, approach or policies toward uh, some of these issues. I think the dams issue is actually one where we're seeing now uh, more of a change of heart, if you ask me, because uh, Thailand in the past actually fund mm. many of the dams in, in Laos. Right. Oh, there's also alternatives. So Australia has signed a deal with Singapore. They've, um, they're constructing the world's largest solar plant and mm-hmm. are running a cable to supply 20% of Singapore's electricity, I think within five years, which kind of undermines the whole dam strategy, which I uh, quickly point out was a similar strategy adopted by uh, Sarawak, Malaysia, Tide Mahmud, and the Bakun Dam, which was absolutely massive, and they were get planning to sell electricity to Singapore as well, but it just never happened. Yeah, I mean, the, as, as I said, I think the, the countries that look at I think if the, pro- the problem with many countries actually they look, by the time they, they come up with their policy, policies they want to adopt, they, they are stemming from problems that happened five, ten years ago. Right. If you look at Cambodia, for example, I mean Cambodia has, has, has always faced uh, blackouts and, and mm-hmm. shortages and uh, we're not connected through that whole country, most of the populations remain uh, either in the dark or, or have very limited, limited access to electricity and the price are very, very high for, for the economic, for the, you know, for the income level of the, of the people. So, so that's a, a current problem, but that was actually a massive previous problem. It has improved. Right, in, in the past. Yeah. So, so it has improved. So they, they come up with policies now or, or projects and, and getting into deals the, now mm. that made sense now or mm-hmm. five years ago. Right. By the time these dams and coal power plants get built and come online, that's going to be that's possibly be become stranded assets. Right. And and that's the that's the issue we want to raise. Is, and that is uh, many of these projects and needs to come up with longer term vision and looking at, at all of these uh, trends. And the trends is the renewable energy is actually getting a lot cheaper than non-renewable That's energy. That's right, yeah, this, and, the and, science uh, is taking over. And, and, and if you look at that pattern, even if it's actually at the same price point now, mm. in terms of cost, uh, that won't remain the same. One is actually going on the on the, yeah. on the the low, you know, yeah, keep sure. on pu- going low, and another one is actually keeping steady. Yeah. And fossil fuel, the cost of it is actually keeping being pretty steady while the, the cost of uh, renewable is actually going lower every single year. Right, and, it's a, and, and in yeah. five years, uh, by the time many of these projects come, come into um, uh, the pipe, um, a renewable will, will be far lower, far cheaper. Right. right. Now, um, like Laos, well, actually unlike Laos, Cambodia is also a one-party state, which is, um, uh, I don't think that was by design, that was, I think, uh, more unintentional, uh, but let's go back to elections in Cambodia in 2013. Uh, the opposition party, Sam Rains and Kim Sakar, did not win enough votes. To, uh, they, they did not. I mean, they got 45%, and even if you included, uh, if you made allowances for the allegations of uh, rigging, uh, perhaps another five, ten percent, but either way, that would never have been enough for them to win, uh, win government. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is that then we had the protests. They refused to take their place in parliament. The party was subsequently banned. And at elections in 2018, the Cambodian People's Party ran every one, sorry, won every seat contested in parliament. In Parliament, Where, can you take us back to 2013? And uh, I know you're you're the expert on this. Uh, where do you think mistakes were made? I did the analysis in 2013. Uh, the the provinces that have potential of actually switching seat mm-hmm. would be uh, Kandal. Uh, I think the the, the difference uh, was so small. It was like 
200 votes uh -huh. to add more and more seats uh, toward the, the opposition CNRP, right. away from the CPP. Uh, and the, the second would be Krejci. Uh, Krejci. Uh, Krejci would be needing about 16,000 votes to switch. Uh, and then the third one would be Sim Reapers, about 30,000, which is really, really difficult to overcome. It's a lot of votes. And, uh, and then nothing other, there's no other provinces actually that come close. Right. Um, the, the main problems of the, the, for the opposition in 2013 was the small provinces. Uh, in, in some way, mm. the calculations of seat in Cambodia is very similar to the U.S. Electoral College. Right. And most people don't, didn't, didn't get it. You don't really count the nation, the national popular vote. No, it's not it's a first pass. It's correct. not first pass vote. It's not first pass at all. But it's basically, uh, it's basically winner. Sim it's, it's it's not as winners take all in each of the province. But, uh, but these the way seats allocated is actually based on provincial vote, not na national level. Okay. So so in smaller provinces, uh, the ruling party seems to do well because it's actually very remote. And you know, and the the, the ruling party has been entrenched. That was actually the main differences in two thousand thirteen between the ruling party and the opposition. Mm -hmm. uh, second, uh, we didn't. I was working at, at the Cambodian Centre for Human Rights back then, and we monitored the election quite uh, intensively. And um, I didn't see any evidence of of that either from the poll observers, no. um, Tom Frells, and we. I was part of the situation room where we try to, to uh, uh, collectively uh, take in all of the, the information from the poll observers um, yeah. on the ground. Um, we didn't get we didn't get enough evidence uh, evidence from from the observer or the opposition party themselves who made the claims that they they have mm -hmm. they've won the election. Uh, we didn't get any evidence from them. But let's go back to that. The uh, this was when Sam Rainsy uh, came out too early, I guess. Mm -hmm. And actually claimed victory over the issue a statement actually yeah. right yeah. and so he's issued a statement he's claimed victory over the 2013 election he hadn't won it. he didn't have the numbers and I, I I don't want to appear rude but how much of it's just uh, bloody mindedness in that they in turn he, he, he kind of painted himself into a corner where no one wants to back down well, he, he made the, 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 the statement too early. The number had come in mainly from bigger provinces. And the cities, and, and, I believe. And, and more provinces that's actually right. closer to Phnom Penh. Phnom Penh geographically is also very central. Yeah. Uh, and historically, it's never really favored the ruling party anyway. Historically, most, yeah, most of the, the provinces actually close to Phnom Penh right. don't usually favor the ruling party. And it has that tendencies to favor the opposition, just also because also they have access to radio, back mm. then was radio play, still play okay. yeah. a prominent role, it was only the, the, main, the main radio station back then, which remained independent in 2013 was uh, Beehive, FM 105, mm. and remember that the director, the owner of Beehive uh, was I in do. prison twice, yep. and, and so, so that, that's, that radio impact was there, and if you look at the, um, the, the Provinces where the opposition did pretty well was actually all based on the same coverage areas. I, I know the right. coverage area of Beehive so well because we did studies on that. Right. And um, so so that's that's the the um, the main culprit of the of the twenty thirteen election. Of course, I think the the opposition made that that uh, statement a bit too early and they didn't want to retract. Um, but second, they couldn't produce the evidence. Or that was what poll the numbers the either. Poll, I mean, yeah. they, they have a lot of poll observers, but none of them send them sending their their poll number, or they have, and, and they couldn't produce that. I mean, the the organizations of the ruling party and the opposition has been pretty weak to say the least. It's really, really sure. weak. So it could be that, that their claims are right, but they they couldn't produce the 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 evidence. But neither did I see it from the from the observer, the independent observers either. So so it's very difficult to to draw a conclusion from from that. Uh, what happened, but but it's fair enough to say I haven't seen any evidence to the to the fact that the opposition did win the the uh, yeah. election. Where does that leave them now? Well, that that left huge bad taste uh, in in the sense that I think the challenge was was one number one. I think there was a huge wake up call, and the ruling party felt that they 
mm. they truly were Yeah, they threatened. were frightened. I mean, they, they were frightened. Yeah, they didn't realise they were so close. But the second, the chance of losing not just the election, they, they, they saw the 2013 movement and the protests afterward. Mm. Not just as losing the election, but losing everything. Yep. And, and that's the history of Cambodia, that there's no real peaceful change of power. Uh, not no one political party has, um, and then that's pretty much all of them, but not one main political party has accepted defeat since, 90, since the 93 elections. If I went back through and had a look at Plinson Peck, the In, CPP, yeah. um, Sam Rainsy, Human Rights Party, CNRP, none of them have ever actually turned around and said, yes, yes and, we and accept the never, vote. And there's, never trans- there's never transitions of right. power and peacefully anyway. I've, I've covered many elections here and I've done elections when um, uh, European independent monitors have come out and said, yes, we think this election is, uh, I think the term was more like largely free and fair, but the, they were saying that the results fairly reflect the um, attitudes of the people, yeah, nobody accepts and it. nobody will accept it. it, it it's, uh, I've seen I've seen the criticisms of international organisations and international observer when they say things that doesn't fit the the narratives mm-hmm. of different political parties, and that's done by by every political parties in the country, in the mm-hmm. world, from the ruling to the opposition. If the if the independent people, observe, international or local of, uh, observers say anything that, that doesn't favour them or doesn't fit into their own kind of narratives. They, right. they, they instead of actually challenge that, they've actually usually uh, accused uh, of uh, the, the, uh, the people of, of being either partisan or so loud. Right. So, Let's bring it forward. Uh, and we'll t- tidy this part of the conversation up. So they claim victory, they, the opposition that is, they refused to accept the results. The evidence of uh, widespread rigging was absolutely flimsy. Uh, I, I never saw any either at the time. Uh, they refused to take their seats in Parliament and there's uh, widespread protests across the country for more than a year, or particularly in Phnom Penh, I should say. So what, what would... How should a government react if it was assuming it's legitimately elected? You have an opposition that won't take its seats in Parliament, that insists it won. It has very little support outside because the numbers don't stack up. Um, what, what? I, I can tell you two, um, two perspectives. Right. One is actually what the, the ruling party likely perceives Mm. and therefore likely react and how, how they would likely react and what they should do. Mm-hmm. Uh, in, in because of that, that lack of, of understanding of, of um, democracies and institutional democracies right. in, in, in the sense that, that elections should be a normal process of, of changing uh, political leadership but not every, every aspect of, of the government. Right. Uh, there's lack of that understanding and because of that they, they naturally react in, they actually either react in, in fear, frightened, and and see it as a as a as a challenge to the duel to the death in a, in a right. way, right? So they act in, in the only way they, they felt no comfortable and, and somewhat know how, and that means they they try to make sure that will not happen again, mm-hmm. and that will not that the challenge to their their way or their rules will not happen again, and they of course they react by trying to to uh, try to undermine the opposition movement. Um, one of the main problems of 2013 was the legitimacy of the NEC, right? The, ele- national, the national election, election, election commission, commission, yeah. and and the and the courts, mm-hmm. because in in the election process, in any disputes, you go to the NEC to verify any credible disputes, and, right. and that's a pro prob- a, a a normal uh, uh, process to address election disputes. Uh, had the NEC been more credible, more legitimate, mm-hmm. then then that would solve many of these claims by different uh, parties t- um, making different claims. Mm. Uh, so I think the, the government should react by enhancing the credibility and the legitimacy of the NEC. Right. Of course, you, you can amend the, the law on creating the NEC, the election law, and, and the body itself by getting better 
more independent, impartial people on board. Um, the second process of the dispute would go to the Constitution Council. Mm -hmm. That's a supreme uh, judiciary, a judicial body. They should, the government should react, the National Assembly should react by making sure that that body mm. is, is very credible. Um, and, and by doing that, then they would prevent future conflicts from future, mm. future elections. They didn't do that, of course, as we all know, um, the, the opposition was, dis was dissolved by, um, by the Supreme, National Supreme Council of 2013. It, it kind of goes back to one of those cornerstones of democracy, which even, and I've, se I've seen it challenged in Western democracies and politicians who, don't, who do not understand, mm -hmm. uh, and that is the separation of powers. Mm -hmm. And in a Western democracy, it, it's interesting watching that clash and people like, no, hands off, you know. And here it's, a, uh, we have the same government that came in after the Khmer Rouge, essentially. The same people in power. Separation of powers is not a strong point uh, culturally. And uh, this goes back to what you were saying about the NEC, the National Election Commission and uh, the Constitutional uh, Bodies in that. How do, you, how do you give them that power? It's like other countries. It's assumed here. It's never been. It hasn't been assumed, and for some very good reasons as well. I mean, who's to blame for a thirty-year war? Uh, but um, how do you get that culture of the separation of powers that allows these groups to operate independently of the executive? One, I, th I think there's there's a lot of insecurity. Just like people who have been hungry for so long and don't have the access to food, they they tend to overeat. Right. Um, the Cambodian mindset, the uh, psyche is, is very similar in the sense that many of us, uh, many of the people now have access to wealth and they feel, still feel in insecure. They still feel food insecure. They still feel insecure in terms of uh, being looked upon of humiliations. For right. example, we, we, we've been humiliated as a country and, and as a people, for example, for, mm -hmm. for many, many decades, not, if not centuries. So in that sense, I think there's a there's a, a push back and, and that's going overboard by, by overdo most right. things, right? And this is the, the roots of, um, I felt the roots of um, some of the greeds we, we have seen. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the, the just incredible how, how... All or nothing mentality. All of nothing mentality because yeah. the, there was not peaceful transition. And uh, of course we, we had histories of killing each other when there's when you lose power so so um people look at politics from that from that perspective and, and it scares them and they it scares they've, them but, but, but you, right how do you really how how do you really address that i think that i think you you can address it by it, it gotta be there's gotta be some easing into building that confidence building that trust again and and politicians community politicians are not based on that if you look at the opposition politics, for example, accusing the CPP of being the puppet of Vietnam, the, right. the, the starch enemy who, whose only intention is to swallow Cambodia after they've done it. And it's an, Trump, argument, that makes no, it's an yeah. argument that makes no sense given uh, its relationship with China at the moment. Exactly. <laughs> it it yeah. makes no sense, but also it, it was basically it was derived from the histories of the Cold War, right? During the Cold War, it doesn't really matter. It was not democracies. It was nationalists. Sure. It was a movement against the the expansion of communist bloc, for example. Right. No, Asian's uh, foundation. Right. Correct. Uh, nationalism was was really a, a counter to communist expansions, right? So so you, we've seen nationalism on the rise after that during the Cold War, and now we still seen we have still witnessed uh, remnants of of that past. And and so so if you look at the Cambodian politics, it's still it's still very much Cold War, stuck in the Cold War mentality. Still still Cold War politics. Right. And um, and none of the actors, by the way, in Cambodian mm -hmm. politics has escaped that they were, they were um, remnant of that. They were actually from that era. Sure. Yeah. And they remain the main actors of Cambodian politics today. And they're, they're, and they're quite proud of the fact that. Uh, they were the ones who defected from the Khmer Rouge, went to Vietnam and came back and... Yeah, but also the opposition are proud of being the one who actually fight against the Vietnamese occupation in the 1980s. And, sure. And, you know, so, 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 so you, get, you get two sides right. of, the, 
of the same kind of kind of politics, political right. coins, and that's the the main problems we have today. I've always thought that um, Sam Rainsy and Hun Sen are the two sides of the same coin. Exactly. But uh, anyway, okay. On that note, uh, just uh, uh, what's shaping up for? It's been a Everybody knows it's been a hell of a year, uh, 2020. It's been very difficult as a future forum think tank. How do you think 2021 will shape up? It's gonna. I think. I think this this whole COVID things will drag on for the next five six months. Um, but at least there's a lot of hope now, going knowing full well that the the beginning of the end is always upon us, and, and we're looking toward that light at the end of the long tunnel. Um, I think. Because of that, I think many of the people still on hold on to hope, mm-hmm. if they can. Uh, we've seen so many small businesses that actually uh, got closed down uh, over the past year. I think many of them will not make it till the till the end of the tunnel. Uh, so we're gonna see some more closures uh, in the next uh, few months. Um, but but I think there's still hope of a rebound, uh, and, and I think that's reflected in in other projections. Um, Cambodian people seems to be a lot more optimistic than they should be. Um, it's it's a bit more difficult to explain uh, in the in the Western. Uh, it's all right. Context, I, uh, I, I understand where you're coming um, from. But I think it's still also a population full of young people. Also, so there's there's good that they are optimistic and somewhat ambitious. They should be at that age. Yeah, they should be at that age. Right. We don't, let's not ruin it for them. No, absolutely <laughs> not. On that note, uh, Uwe Rackle, thanks very much. It's been a delight. All right, well, thank you. Cheers. Thanks,